Amen. 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 Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. You know, again, it's a privilege to be here to, you know, just get into the word and to share a word with us. And, you know, we really thank God for, you know, the privilege to be here. And we really thank him for life. Amen. Amen. As we go through tonight, we, you know, pray that, you know, the souls of individuals tuning in will be blessed. And somebody under the sounding of our voice will make the decision to turn to the Lord. But this is not, you know, about me. It's not about the bishop. It's not about anybody that is here. But, you know, it's really about God. And the, the fact that God wants to save soul, you know, makes a difference. So as we go tonight, I'm just going to open in prayer and then we, you know, get in the word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we appreciate you tonight. We love you. We bless your name. We magnify you. We thank you again for this privilege, for this opportunity to be here, mighty God. We ask God that you come in our midst. Oh God, we might be gathering over the internet, but you said we are two, two or three are gathered. Oh mighty God, you will have a medium by which we gather. And we pray, mighty God, that you will bless each and every soul tonight. We ask God that as we discuss things pertaining to holiness and as we recap God, baptism of the Holy Ghost, that your perfect will be done. Speak to your people like only you want to. And we pray, God, that when all is said and done, that you be glorified and that you be lifted up in the name of Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name. And let me just take time out to welcome everyone that is tuning in, irrespective of where you are tuning in from. We welcome you tonight and, you know, we give God thanks for you that you are here and that you, you know, have tuned in to hear what the Lord has to say. Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. So, you know, our team scripture, the first one is taken from 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, and it reads thus. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirit and doctrine of devils. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God had created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. The second scripture is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 4 from verses 1 through to 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own loss shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Amen. Amen. All right, so last week we looked at baptism of the Holy Spirit. Remember, we have been saying that in order to receive salvation, in order to be saved, that we must be identified with the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. We must walk in newness of life. Amen. And we look in baptism and we say that as an individual we must be identified with Christ. Jesus said to Nicodemus, marvel not, I say unto thee, you must be born again. Be born of the water and of the spirit. Amen. We did say last week that in order for somebody to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that he must first repent of his sins, and then he must believe, he must have faith. And we went through the topic on faith, and we did say without faith it is impossible to please God. 
For any man come to God must believe that God is and that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, I know that many of us who are watching, we are somehow knowledgeable about the doctrine. Amen. And, you know, sometimes a little refresher is good. And sometimes there are some things that we might point out that, you know, you might have not seen it that way, you know, but all credit be to God. Amen. So we look at the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And we did mention that God is holy. When we talk about the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, we are essentially talking about the Spirit of God that God has been, that God has given to mankind. We must bear in mind that God is holy. In fact, there are many scriptures, amen, that tells us that God is holy. And we look at 1 Peter 1, verse 16. No, I'm not even going to read it because as we get down into holiness, we are going to use this scripture as the reference and we are going to get into the scripture and we are going to talk about what Peter said. Amen. So God is holy and we establish that. The original word that has been transferred from the Greek is pneuma, which means spirit, and hagion, which means holy. Now, when you put those together, you get holy Spirit. We also established last week that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. Acts 5, 3 and 4. But Peter said to Ananias, Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back a part of thine price of thine land? While as it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So we are saying that the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God. And if you look at when the apostles spoke and, and the scripture you know, made reference of it, when he had that dialogue with Ananias, amen, Ananias sold that parcel of land and he planned with his wife that we are going to say that this is what we sell the land for and when we tell him that you know he can look on us that yes we 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 sell all our land and, and we give everything we don't take back anything and if you look at that in itself that is the pride of life amen and when they came to the apostle and they told him that the apostle recognized through the spirit of god that they were lying and said why have satan tempted you to lie to the Holy Spirit. But then further down, he said that you have not lied to men, but you have lied to God. So I want us to know just from the scripture and from other passages that we made reference of that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. We also look at Romans 8 verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Again, the apostle, he first of all said, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, we know that it's only the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, that comes to dwell in men. So he was saying that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So when we look at the passage, we can clearly conclude that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. I also made mention, amen, and it's very important for us to keep this in mind and bear this in mind, um, that in order for us to operate the way that we, God wants us to operate, amen, in order for us to walk in this newness of life, we cannot do it of our own. It can only be accomplished by the Spirit of God. Amen. So when you look at a man, an individual, take for, for example, you know, myself. If I should of myself, amen, I cannot walk how God wants me to walk. I cannot live how God wants me to live. It's only because of the Holy Ghost. 
Amen. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, we said the spirit will guide you. Amen. And it is the spirit of God that will help us to live for God and to walk the way in which he wants us to walk. Amen. So we mentioned that Samuel, in 1 Samuel 16, verse 13 and 14, verses 13 and 14, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brother. This is now David. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and ran to Ramah. No, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. I want you to understand that just like I, I, I've said, that without the spirit of God, we cannot move, we cannot operate, we cannot do the things that God wants. We cannot function as a spiritual being if, if, if it is not for the spirit of God. And here the Bible is telling us, we know David as a great king, but again the Bible tells us that is. It was when the Spirit of God came upon David after Samuel anointed him. That is the time David began to do the things that God wanted him to do. Yes, he had a good heart and yes, he was tending to the sheep. But it was the Spirit of God that made a difference in the life of David. So last week we looked also at the Holy Spirit and we list them in points. We say we look at the importance of having the Holy Spirit. We look at the prophecies about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We look at the New Testament promises and the fulfillment in the apostolic church, the signs. And then we look lastly at the signs of knowing when one received the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we're just running through them. Amen. It is important, the, whole, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is, it is important. Why? Because it is a part of salvation. We went through the scripture in John chapter 3, verses 1, 2 to 5. And we that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus and he said, Marvel not, I say, you must be born again. You must be born of the water and be born of the spirit. That spirit that Jesus Christ was talking about was the baptism or is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so Nicodemus said, can a man when he is old um, born again? And Jesus said, look here, um, you must be born of the water and of the spirit. I say unto you, you must be born again. The wind blow it where it listed, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot not tell whence it cometh, and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born, amen, of the Spirit. The verse, this verse places emphasis on not only water baptism, but also the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is a part of the plan of salvation you cannot amen be saved without being filled with the spirit the bible also tells us in romans 8 verses verse 9 amen but ye are not in the flesh but ye are in the spirit if so be that the spirit of god dwells in you no if any man have not the spirit of christ he is none of his Anyone who does not have the spirit, and this is the ESV, of Christ does not belong to him. So it can't, we, we can't tell folks, and this was one of the points that we brought out last week. We can't tell folks that, look here, if you accept Jesus Christ, if you come to an altar and you pray a prayer and you said, yes, you confess with your mouth, you know, but your heart is not at the place. And you say, yes, I accept Jesus Christ as Savior. You just say it because... Somebody tell you to say it. You know, there's nothing from your heart. Amen. And then when you leave the altar, and them say, look here, you, they, took, they, they write on your name and say, yes, you are saved. You have the Holy Ghost. I want to tell the church, and I want to tell those who probably do not understand and you are tuning in, 
that that is a lie from the pit of hell and we need to, to, to make sure that when, we, when you hear folks talk and you hear them say, look here, just pray the prayer, nothing like that. The Bible does not teach us that. What the Bible says is that you must be born again. Amen. So the baptism of, of the Holy Spirit, it is a part of the plan of salvation. Now we also say that the Holy Spirit is important because it is the Holy Spirit now that will cause that change in our body when, amen, the trumpet of the Lord shall sound. And we know that we are not looking for a pie in the sky. We believe, amen, because if the Holy Spirit is real and I am a recipient of the Holy Spirit, Amen, I can attest to that. Then heaven must be real. So we are not believing God for a pie in the sky. And when Christ comes again, amen, what is going to happen when the trumpet of God sound? You must have the Holy Spirit because it is the Holy Spirit that is going to cause that change. That change, amen. And when we look at the Bible in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says that, you shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. So I want us to know that the only way that change is going to happen is if we have the Holy Spirit. So let us not take it lightly. And, you know, folks that say that, look here, I'm saved. And as individuals that are concerned about their soul, we have not asked them if they have received the Holy Ghost. Remember when we went through baptism, the Apostle Paul was concerned about the, 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 the soul of John the Baptist's disciples. And he said unto them, well, if you see if, and, and you receive the Holy Ghost. And they said, which we haven't even heard of Holy Spirit. He said, well, if you have not heard about Holy Ghost, what then were you baptized? And they said unto John baptism. Because was concerned about their soul. If we are concerned about soul, amen, of folks that are around us. And let's look at a save. And, and you have this feeling that and you don't ask them. You must ask them, yes. You say you're saved. How is it that you know that you are saved? Amen. And that is a question that we must be able to. I know that I'm saved because I've repented of my sins, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins. And I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. Amen. And if you ask them and you hear them say, boy, they will just go to the altar. You need to explain to them the gospel and explain to them what it takes for a man to be saved. Amen. Amen. So the Spirit also makes intercession for us. Romans 8, 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. For we know not what to, to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Amen. So sometimes as individuals, we have burden. We said, and we are burdened down with some things. And, and sometimes we want to pray about some things. And it is the Holy Spirit that makes intercession for us. So sometimes when we, we, we go down to pray, for, to pray, amen, and we get in the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit now makes intercession. Yes, we talk in another Language that sometimes we don't understand. Sometimes we groan and it's the spirit that groan it. But amen, we are, we are the spirit make it intercession for us. Bless the name of God. And then the spirit also help us to live a life that is pleasing to God as we had mentioned earlier on. And John 16 verse 13, how it be hit. When he the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. Spirit also gives us power to live above the flesh. 
This I say then, Galatians 5, verse 16 and 17. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the loss of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that he cannot do the things he would. I want us to know tonight as children of God that we need to walk in the spirit, walk in this Holy Ghost. Because the flesh lost it against the spirit and the spirit, the spirit wants us to do the things of God. But the flesh, the desires, amen, that we were born with want us, it tends towards sin. And the apostle Paul said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? But I want us to, as children of God, to have to be persuaded, to have a made up mind that we are going to walk in the spirit, walk pleasing to God in the spirit that we might not fulfill the loss of the flesh. Then there was prophecy. And remember, you know, as we go through and as we get into holiness, we are going to see it even the, the same way because as we have been saying, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, dear a little. Amen. So we have been saying that from the Old Testament. We talk about belief. We talk about it from the Old Testament and then we come over into the New Testament. We talk about repentance. We talk about that from the Old Testament because from, from, from way back there, God has been calling man to repent and then we come over in the New Testament and we show you that, look here, God is calling us to repent and still when we spoke about water baptism we mentioned bless God that from that time baptism was dear in typology and in the New Testament God requires baptism as a part of the plan of salvation then no we, when we spoke about the Holy Spirit last week we look at the prophecy amen first Peter Mention a couple of things. But when we look at scripture like Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 33. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt with my covenant they break, although I was an husband man unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. The covenant is now in our hearts. Amen. Bless the Lord. The covenant is now in our hearts. The covenant is written in our hearts. Amen. By the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Joel 2, 28. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see vision. Also upon the servants and upon the, un the unmaids. In those days will I pour out my spirit. The New Testament promises in Matthew 3 verses 11. John said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. Who shows I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And with fire. In Luke 11 verse 13. If ye then be in evil know how to give good gifts unto your children. This was Jesus speaking. How much more shall your heavenly father. Give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. So when we look at the fulfillment of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we look 
at the, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, 1 to 4. And it was on the day of Pentecost that the Holy Ghost was poured out. So all the prophecies that came, that, that, that all the prophets that prophesied in the Old Testament, Amen. John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, spoke of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself, amen, said that his father will send the comforter. Now when we look in the book of Acts, all of those now culminate in the book of Acts. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, the Bible says that they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And we know the story. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. So on the day of Pentecost, they received the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter got up and he spoke and he, as he spoke, he was con it was confirmed the other apostles they agreed with him and when he spoke about the baptism of the Holy Ghost he quoted from Joel and he said this was that which was spoken by the prophet Joel that in the last days the Lord said I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh how do I know that I received the Holy Ghost if you look in the book of Acts, which is the action book, you're going to recognize that on the day of Pentecost, the people around them recognized that something was different. And what was different? Because they heard them spoke in tongues and they said that these were mad, mad men. And he said, No, we're not mad and we're not drunk. Amen. He said that we're not mad and we're not drunk like you suppose. But we, Amen. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is the Holy Spirit. Isaiah also foretold it himself for with stammering lips and another tongue. Will I speak to this people? Amen. So God had told us from in the Old Testament that he's going to use tongues. Amen. To speak to the people. And it was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Mark 16 verse 17. He said these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with what? New tongues. So you can't be, somebody can't say that you receive the Holy Ghost. Or you believe God. And you have never spoken in something is wrong. Something is wrong. So he, these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall speak with new tongues. Are you a believer? The 120 in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, they spoke with tongues. If you look at Cornelius, Cornelius' story was one of the good, the good story, the better story. Amen. And it is found in Acts 10, verses 44 to 46. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them. Yet yes, Cornelius' heart was at the place. The heart of his family, those around him, was at the place. The Bible said that he was a devoted man, devoted to who? God. Amen. And while Peter yet spoke the words, the Bible said that the Holy Ghost fell upon them. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why? Amen. Because they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. I want us to know that if you have not, you said that you received the Holy Ghost and you never yet spoke in tongues, you have not received the Holy Ghost. Amen. And it's not, it's not my word. It's what the Bible tells us. Amen. So tonight we want to know, look into holiness because we said that the, the, the apostles we, we are looking now at the apostles doctrine amen and P, Paul said to Timothy that the time is going to come that when they will not endure sound doctrine they will not embrace sound doctrine 
Amen. And they are going to have itching ears and they are going to turn onto fables. And I want us to understand that that it, 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 it is not 10 years to come, but even right now when we are looking around us and some things are happening. Church, I'm telling you, you, you might be might be covered, so to speak, and, and, and you're not hearing some of the things that are happening. But some serious things that are happening, you have some men that are saying that they are prophets. And they come on radio and they come on TV. Amen. And they tell folks some things and you'll be surprised. And when it don't happen, when it don't come through, I don't know what. And, and, I, and, I, and I have to sit down the other night and I have to wonder. If a man come and he says that he's a prophet, listen to this. If a man come and he says that he's a prophet, and him tell you, say, look, you're locked up in your house. Because something going past, and people going to drop down and dead. And you're locked up in your house. And nothing don't happen on the day and the time that he said that it would happen. I would have to consider seriously if I should listen to such a person again. You get what I'm saying? And there are folks, and this is, and this is how you know that they, 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 these false prophets are working with some spirit. And when they catch you, you know, amen, these spirits come and attach themselves to you. Your eyes are blind. Your spiritual eyes, so to speak, and you, you, you cannot see. Because if, if it don't happen, it's like, it's just nothing. This man is, 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 is dear, he's is seeing God, he's hearing from God. If he's seen God and if he's hearing from God and he says, Thus saith the Lord, then it should come to pass. And the eyes of many are blinded. And hang here as we go through this, this doctrine. Amen. I want us to understand truth. I want us to know truth. I want us to be able to identify when these speakers, false prophets, and teachers speak, how to be able to identify it. How to know to stand up into what you believe so that you will not be persuaded otherwise. Though we are an angel from heaven speak any other doctrine unto you, let him be a curse. So as we look at holiness tonight, the, the scripture that we need to pay attention to is 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16. Amen. And let us look at that one. It says, Wherefore, gird up the lines of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourself according to the former loss of your ignorance, but as he which had called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. This word conversation is not talking about the conversation that you have with your neighbor. Amen. But it's talking about how you live. Amen. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. We can try to teach what the Bible says about holiness. We can tell you the requirements that God has for holiness. We can tell you that it's a command. Be ye holy, for I am holy. However, it is incumbent on the individual to live holy. So, irrespective of what I tell you today, irrespective of what you have been hearing from ever since you become a part of this faith, amen, it is you, the individual, that has the responsibility to live a life that is pleasing and acceptable unto the Lord. I want us to know that the preacher can preach, amen, and the teacher can teach. But as individuals, we have got to be persuaded in our mind 
that holiness is necessary in order to make it into heaven, then we must live holy. The problem that we are having as it pertains to holiness as a church, amen, the problems that we are having as it pertains to holiness, it is that there are different standards for different individuals. The bishop on this side of the vineyard um, might be teaching exactly what the Bible says about holiness. But on the other hand, there is another pastor, another bishop that is teaching something else and, and, and consider it as being holy. Amen. Now we on this side might look over on the other side and we say that if they, they are going to heaven and if they, they are being taught that they can do this and do that and dress a certain way, then we should be able to do it because it's, and, and that is the problem that we are having because there are different standards. And when we look around the church arena as it pertains to holiness, but when it comes to God, amen, when it comes to God, it is one standard. God has one standard for holiness. If we look on the other side and see that they are doing something, it is upon us to therefore question as a Christian, as an individual that desires God, should I do that? Is that right? What does the Bible have to say about it? And like I said earlier on, the Bible might not mention certain things verbatim. When we talk about doctrine earlier on, the Bible might not say certain things word for word. But I want you to understand that based on the principles, we can draw some conclusion and know that that is not what we ought to do as children of God. I want us to understand that if we are going to do as the scriptures say, be ye holy for I am holy. We must remember that God has no two, no three, no four standards as it pertains to holiness. God has one standard. Not holiness according to Brother Bailey. Not holiness according to Bishop Daly. But holiness according to God's standard. Anything outside of that is unacceptable. Be ye holy, for I am holy. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, we mention that God is holy. And, I, and as we go down and talk about holiness, I want us to know that God is holy. Whenever we talk about the heights of holiness, we can only look to God. He is the epitome of holiness. There is none like him. Are any to be compared to him. If we look at Exodus 15 verse 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness? Amen. Fearful in praise. Doing wonders. He's not just holy enough. But is majestic in holiness. In other words, his holiness is impressive. The, the, you can't compare anything or anyone to him as it pertains to holiness. Oh, Jesus. First Samuel 2, verse 2. There is none holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is none beside him. Nor is there any rock 
like our God. And then let us look at Isaiah 6, verses 2 and 3. So, we are now establishing that God is holy. And I want us to, to, to get this. Because if we are going to get holiness, amen, we must get the fact that God is holy. Sometimes our, uh, our behavior, amen, what we do, our conversation, as the scripture said, how we, our lifestyle is, it, 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 it says that we think that God is not holy. Because if we think that God is holy and we're trying to please God, then our walk will be holy. These are angels that are in the presence of the Lord. These are angels that were made and have not sinned. They are in the presence of the Lord. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twenty he covered his face. And with twenty he covered his feet. And with twenty he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Oh, Jesus, these are angels, mighty God. They are in the presence of God. And the only expression that they can find is to say, holy, holy, holy. Can you imagine the, the, the awesomeness of God? From ever since God made them, this was their duty. And they showed forth the holiness of God. The most frequently used attribute of God is found in the Old Testament. And it refers to his holiness. Some, some 200 and odd times the, the, the Bible makes mention of God being holy. The seraphims cover their face, amen, in awe and wonderment as they cry, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Similarly, we find in the New Testament, Revelation 4, verse 8, this attribute of God being extolled by the four living creatures who cried day and night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. All these four living creatures did was to cry day and night, the Bible says. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This is how holy, God, when we talk about holiness, you see, because we don't understand true holiness and full holiness, when we say holiness, it just comes like a holy, it just comes like any other, but it's not any other thing. We, the word, we, we, we use a word to describe, but look here, the words cannot describe it. This, if we get this, if, if we get this as individuals who love God, if we get this, that, that just God alone is just, I can't find the word, just holy. Then we will mirror our life of the life of Jesus Christ. I would like us to know, as I make a little pause here, that there is a doctrine that says, because the angels say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and because the four beasts say, holy, holy is, holy is the Lord God Almighty, that one holy is for the Father, one holy is for the Son, and one holy is for the Holy Spirit. This is how deceptive and conniving the adversary is. If you are not careful, 
He will use the scriptures on you and twist you up. But if, if you look at the scripture, you know, and that is why I'm still trying to understand the scripture that says the natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit. Probably because now I'm safe and the, the spirit kind of open my spiritual eyes. Because the same scripture you know, that is used for that doctrine is the same scripture that says, Holy, holy is the L-O-R-D. So, so if you're not careful, the adversary will twist the scripture, will you, the same scripture, you know, twist it, and will cause you to depart from the truth. Isaiah 43 and verse 15. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. And of course, there are more scriptures that we could look at. However, the passages that we have read, just, just a few, amen, they mention about this attribute of God. Another way to refer to the holiness of God is to say it is absolute perfection. His very being is completely absence of a trace of sin. James 1 verse 3 tells us, God cannot be tempted with evil. There is no evil in him. He is high above any other and no one can compare to him. God's holiness pervades in his entire being and shape all his attributes. So if we talk about God is love, we're talking about a holy love. If we're talking about God is merciful, it's a holy mercy. If we're talking about the wrath of God, it's a holy wrath. When the Bible talks about the habitation of God, it says, Die holy habit. Anywhere God is, any, amen, it is holy. When, oh God, when, 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 when he, he manifested himself at that place to Moses, amen, I tell you, you know, where God is, oh God, it's just, it just changed. He said, Moses, take off your shoes because the place where you're standing, it, it was holy before, you know. But now that God manifests himself there, he said, Moses, the place where you stand is holy ground. The, his habitation is holy. This is the kind of God that we're talking about. And I want us to understand that because this God is holy, God, God can't really deal with the, the unholy thing, the unclean thing, you know. And so look here, there's a call on us as Christians to live holy. Yes, God is holy everything about him is holy but there is a call for us to be holy like we have been saying and we have been doing we have been talking about the the, the scriptures and um, from the old testament to the new testament so god is holy and he calls all people to be holy just as we call the old testament saints to holiness so it is that the new testament saints are called to live Holy. Leviticus 11 verses 44 and 45. For I am the Lord your God. He shall therefore sanctify yourselves. And he shall be holy for I am holy. Neither shall he defile yourselves with any manner of creeping things that creep upon the earth. I want us to understand that before the scripture. They could have ate anything. But no God is trying to distinguish them. And he said look here. Don't eat these things. Don't eat these things. So here it was that God gave them 
instruction. He gave Moses the instruction. And he said to Moses and Aaron. And he said, say unto the children of Israel. Let me say that again. Say unto the children of Israel. He was instructing them on the things that they should eat to be different from the other. Look here. They were eating the same things like the other nation ate. They had on the same clothes, clothes that the nation, the other nation. They live in tent like the other nation. So what would be there to separate them? And so you, you have to understand that God had to know, implement some things to separate them from those who were around them. And him said, look here, I am the Lord your God. He shall therefore sanctify yourselves and shall be holy for I am holy. Neither shall he defile yourselves with any manner of creeping things. I want us to know that God was specific. It was a call for the children of Israel to separate themselves. Amen. From the nations around them. They had everything like the nations around them. But God wanted them to be particular. Peculiar. And so he had to say, look here. Don't eat it. Because the other nation eat it. I don't want you to eat it. This is what I, I want to do. Want you to do. And if you do it. You shall be holy. Amen. And then he said. Leviticus 9. Verse 2. So he wanted to, to separate them. And then he said. Do we you worship? So, so you don't eat that. Don't eat that. And then how you carry out worship. Must be different from all of the other nations. The other nations had image. They did not have an image. And he said, Leviticus 9 verse 2. And he said unto Aaron, Take thee a young calf, a sin offering. Sorry, Leviticus 19 verse 2. I'm sorry. Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, he shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. It was not a question. It was a requirement. Be ye holy, for the Lord your God is holy. Leviticus 20, verse 7. It basically says the same thing. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am I'm holy. If we go down even to Deuteronomy 23, verse 14. And, and, and let us look at this one. It says, For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of the camp. Look here. All right, let us go up and read one verse before. Let us read verse 13 and then we'll come back to 14. I want you to understand because this was not... Uh, God was not physically walking in the camp, you know. But look here, verse 13. And thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon. And it shall be that when thou will ease thyself abroad, because you can't ease yourself in the camp, you know. Thou shalt dig therewith and shall turn back and cover that which cometh from OD. We know what is that, right? So go down to verse 14 now. For the Lord thy God walk in the midst of the camp. To deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy. That he see no unclean. This is talking about the same field from verse 13. You, know. you have to cover it up and you have to do it outside of the camp. So that when God walks through the camp, he will not come upon, Lord God, you have, you have a dog in your yard yet, and your, your shoes get messed up. Mighty God. Look here. And so God is tell, God tell him, look here, cover up that because when I pass through the camp, the camp must be holy. You see the type of God that we're talking about? 
But then when we come over into the New Testament, we recognize the apostle in Romans 12. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. Paul's admonition to the believers in Rome was to sacrifice themselves to God, not a sacrifice on the altar as in the, the mosaic time. But a living sacrifice. This he says is your reasonable. Not even, not even, not even an excellent, you know. But him say, just to present your body, a living sacrifice is a reasonable service. The dictionary defines sacrifice as anything consecrated and offered to God. As believers, how do we consecrate and offer ourselves to God as a living sacrifice? For those who are born again believers, repentance, repent, water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Ghost, and is trying our best to live holy, The Holy Ghost, like I said earlier on, will lead us. But the born again believer must heal himself as an instrument of righteousness. Therefore, self must be slain. It can't be, be that look here. If you're trying to please yourself, you cannot please God. So if you want to walk acceptable and be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which the apostle here spoke about, self must be slain. Every desire of self must be slain if we want to please the Lord. We must give God full control. I must decrease and Christ must increase. I want to tell somebody tonight that if you, you are on the front burner and you put Christ behind, I want you to understand that you're not going about it the right way. Anytime you begin to walk and please yourself, you cannot please God. We must come to the point of being a living sacrifice where when you look at me, I'm a dead man walking because I am not of myself. Amen. For me to live is Christ. So we must, amen, give ourselves to God. There's a call on the saints in the New Testament to, to deny themselves. Amen. Take up the cross and follow Christ daily. Daily we must die. Daily we must kill self. That is why we always say, it, Lord, it's not my will. Thy will be done. Amen. First Thessalonians 4 and 7. For God has not called us unto uncleanness. No, because we've been saying that God is holy. And the call that he calls us now is not unto uncleanness. He calls us from uncleanness. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto what? Holiness. So I don't want us to think that, look here, we come to God and when we come to God, we can he call us unto holiness, but holiness according to my standard because I must get these things done and I must do, do these things. If I have to tell a little lie, I'm going to tell a little lie. If I No, that is not God wants. God wants us to be completely sold out to him. Then when we look at 1 John 3, verses 6 to 10. Who?
Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Even he is righteous. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God, doeth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifested, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. No one who loves him, I'm reading from a different version, no one who loves him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or know him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you and this is lead you astray. And this is what I'm trying to, 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 to accomplish as we go through this study. Don't let anyone lead you astray. And this is what the adversary is trying to do in this day and age. If he can lead you astray, if he can throw something and you bite it, and him put the hook in your jaw and draw you in, it's going to be over. So, 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 little children, dear children, don't let any man deceive you. Don't let any false prophet, don't let any false teacher deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remain in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. And that is why we mention that it is important that you're born again. Because in order to be holy, in order to live holy, you must repent, baptize, Receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And then now you start walking in newness of life. And the Holy Spirit will help you to walk in the newness of life. And so anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. Nor is anyone who does not love their brother. So God call us anytime you hate your brother man. That is unrighteousness. God calls us unto righteousness. He calls us unto holiness. And we start the journey. We start the walk by being born again. When we look down at 1 Peter 1, verses 13 to 16. Wherefore, gird up your lines of your mind. Be sober. So Paul, the, Peter tell us, you know, Mr. Look here. Gird up the lines of your mind. It's the same thing the apostle said. Be ye transformed by the, re the renewing of your mind. And be not conformed to the world. So Peter now is here saying, look here. Wherefore, gird up the lines of your mind. Be sober. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children not 
fashioning yourselves according to the former loss that is according to the world but as he which had called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written be ye holy for i am holy so the apostle said look here Gird up the, li the, 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 the lines of your mind. Gird up the lines of your mind. That is where holiness is going to start from, you know. It's going to start from within our mind. It's going to start from a mindset that we should live holy. Our mind must be at that place. And with the Lord, look here. I am determined that I am going to live holy. I am not saying that we can't walk our toes. But walking your toe is different from a habit. So when persons tell them, look here, I understand that you're human. Yes. And we will tell folks that when you make a mistake. But when something becomes habitual, I can't understand that you're walking your toe. I have to tell you as it is. You are now desiring that thing more than how you desire God. And that's just the way it is. So it starts from within our mind and mindset that we must, amen, serve the Lord and be determined to serve the Lord. So what is holiness? Because we've been talking about holiness and we've been saying, we've been saying, amen, be holy, live holy. What is holiness? Before we go any further, we're going to define. The dictionary defines holiness as the state of being holy. Purity or integrity. Being of a moral character, free from sin, sanctity. Applied to a supreme being, holiness denotes perfect purity or integrity. When we apply the word holiness to human beings, holiness is purity of heart sanctified affections piety or moral goodness it can be sacredness or that which is separated to the service of god and i like us to work with you know this being separated to the service of god the simplest definition for holiness is to be set apart but to be set apart from what? When God told Israel to be holy in Leviticus 11 and 19 that we read, he was instructing them to be distinct from the other nations by giving them specific regulations to govern their lives. Israel at that time was God's chosen nation and God wanted them to be set apart for all other people around them to know that these are my people. So they, they were given standards by God that they should live by. When Peter repeats this in 1 Peter 1, 16, which we have, have read, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. He is talking specifically to believers in this time. As believers, we need to be set apart from the world unto the Lord. We need to to be living by God's standards, by God's statutes, by God's precepts, and not what the world says. God is calling us to be distinct from the world. We cannot be children of God. Amen. And, and, and being children of God, have a liking for the world. We cannot be children of God and love the things of the world. It's just not going to work. Amen. It's just not going to work. We, we cannot be children of God and, and, and have a love, have a strong desire for the things of the world. Wherefore, the Bible says, come out from among them and be a separate, say the Lord, and touch not the unclean things, and I will receive you. I am telling the church tonight 
that we cannot serve two masters. You are going to love one and you are going to eat the other. And like how there is a natural tendency in men to tend towards the things that are evil. That is why the spirit lusted against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. If you have two masters, you are going to tend towards sinning. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. So I am telling the church tonight, you can't serve two masters. You, are, you must separate yourself from the things of the world. And that is the big, one of the biggest challenges we have as a church as it pertains to holiness. And the challenge is not just in particular with, with our assembly, you know, but right around the world. If holiness is being preached, it is, it, 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 it is a problem because you preach it because person is not doing it. And until Jesus Christ return for the saints, holiness will have to be preached. Because look here, remember, you're not just contending with yourself, but you're contending with an adversary that is tempting you to sin. So love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Here in verse 16, he tells us why we should not love the world. He said that all that is in the world is what? The loss of the flesh. The lust of the eyes and the pride of life. The pride of life can be the, the, the lust of the eyes can be can be looked at at anything you, you, you see, your eyes see. So if you look at your neighbor car and neighbor have a, have a nice car, you can't say, Why am I like that car there, you know? And you, you want one like it. Have on a nice hat or a nice shoes. Uh, you, you, you just want and, and, and you know just, you know just want it. You know you do everything within your power to get one like it. That is lusting. Lusting of the lust of the flesh. We have a natural desire for sex. We have a natural desire to eat food. We have a natural desire to you know enjoy ourselves. And, 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 and but when it comes now to us willing to go to an extent where we sin when we are willing to go to that extent where we sin it becomes the loss of the flesh and then the pride of life can be defined as anything that is of the world meaning anything that leads to arrogance lead to Pride lead to boasting, and that is why when you go back now, amen, to the book of Acts, when when Ananias went to the apostle, is the pride of life why he gets smitten down, you know, because he come to lie just just to boast or to look bigger, or proud to say, look here, I sell my land and I give everything to the church. Is the same pride of life that caused Ananias to go to hell. So anything that produces love for the world, the Bible is telling us that we need to stay away from it. We are in the world, but not of the world. Look here, I have, I have ambition to achieve a whole lot of things. But one of the things that I keep on in the back of my mind, I should probably keep it at the front. I can't carry anything with me. When this life is over, I see them make grave tap out a truck and they make grave tap out a aeroplane and grave tap out a house ship. And you can't carry anything with you. If Jesus come today, all that we work and achieve. We can't carry it with can't carry it with us. And the world pass it away, the scripture say. 
and the loss thereof. But he that do it, I love this part. He that do it, the will of God abide it forever. Amen. Amen. When we look at the temptation of Eve, the lust of the flesh was there, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. Amen. The serpent said to her, Look, you it can't eat. Did God really say that you shouldn't eat? And, and the serpent, look here. The first example, Eve was tempted by the serpent to disobey God and to eat the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Eve perceived that the fruit was good for food, pleasing to what? The eyes. And desire for gaining wisdom. She coveted the fruit tree, the fruit in three ways. First, it was appealing to her appetite. John refers to this as the loss of the flesh. The desires for that which satisfy anyone's physical needs. The fruit was also pleasing or delighting to the eyes. That which we see and desire to own or to possess. And then, even some more perceived that the fruit was, would make her wise, giving her wisdom beyond her own. And this is part of Satan's plan to deceive us as children of the Lord. And the world passed it away, the Bible says, and the lost thereof. But he that abide it, and he that do it the will of God, will abide forever. Church, do the will. I am imploring us tonight to do the will of God because he that do it the will of God will abide. When Jesus Christ comes, he you do it the will of God. He will say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. But if you don't do the will of God, he will say, Depart from me. I know you not. In order for anything to be holy, it must be connected to the source of holiness. I want us to understand that if we desire to maintain a holy life, if we desire to live holy, we must be connected to the source. We get connected to the source by, first of all, fulfilling the plan of salvation. But then we are connected to the source or remain connected to the source by Prayer and fasting, some kind go it not except by prayer. I want us to understand that if it's only when bishop call a prayer, if it's only when Wednesday they call a prayer, if they don't announce it one Sunday and say, look here, Wednesday is fasting, you don't fast. They have to tell you that, look here, fasting is Wednesday. I want you to understand that you are a defeated Christian and you are living a defeated life and if you that is how you live your life. You, you, you're just barely connected to the source. Jesus, God himself, is the source of holiness. And if we want to live holy, amen, we have to be connected to the source. Amen. And you know, sometimes, when you're, when you're so deeply connected to the source, you're not preaching some of your conviction to people, you know. Because this is it's me and God relationship. But you know that there are some things that people do. That they can, they, the conviction that God gives. I cannot do it. But I'm not going to preach the standard that God gives me for you. No. You have to get to the place. And, and God will tell you, say, look here, don't do that thing. Do you know, amen, and, and some people are not wise enough that some folks, amen, will, when, when Digicel send in and say, look here, you go and get, take such and such to this number and you might win. You need Holy Ghost to tell you that that is gambling. But some folks, 
want everything to be spilled out. And that is why you must be connected to the source. The source will tell you, say, look here. Even if, it's, even if it's not so simple like that, but the source will tell you, say, look here. Don't do that thing. So nothing is holy in a biblical sense until it is connected to the origin and the source of holiness, which is God himself. There is no holiness independent of God. The holiness of a person is derived and sustained only by being in a special relationship with God. I want to tell the children of God tonight, amen, if we are going to live holy, we must maintain a relationship with the source. You can't get around that. You can't go around that. If you're not maintaining a relationship with God, you're going to find yourself going in a backward manner. And the things that you, you had stopped doing, you find yourself doing them again. So when you have your phone on your, 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 your computer and something pop up, it's going to be hard for you as an individual to, to, to click that and to turn it off. You know. Why? Because... You're not connected to the when you're connected to the source easily, that don't get your attention. And this is how the adversary work. And, and sometimes we have to just put on them things there in a man and find some time with God. But we must be connected to the source. The source. Amen. So God now chooses us for Himself. And if God chooses you for Himself, you must be set apart. You see? The, the, the Bible, 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. He, so God now chose you for himself. You're a royal priesthood. A what? A holy nation. You're not no more normal. You're not no more common thing. You're not no more normal thing. So why is it? Look here. It's only when you're living in a sin you're common. You know. Oh glory to God. But no, we are children of the commonwealth of Israel. We're not no common anymore. No, we have been bought with a price. We have been washed. We have been sanctified. We are, by the blood of Jesus Christ. So we're not any, 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 any and anybody. We're chosen. So we must live that way. If God, when he called the children of Israel, way back there, and he said, look here, this is how I want you to live, so that the other people around you can know. How is it that when we go on the road, people cannot tell that we are Christian based on the hairstyle that we have, based on the things that we wear. We look so much like the world. Look here, you, you can call me an old time Christian. I don't like when I watch all the TV and see how some man I preach and they preach and then they in a t shirt. I just can't. You know that there was a man, Bishop Grizzle, God bless him soul. You know him say, Look here, from your coming to church, look like you're going. That's sticking on my heart. If you're going to church, look, I, look, I, just, I just can't stand it. Why is it that we want to, 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 to take the things that they wear in the dance hall and, and carry them come inside a building that is dedicated to God? Do we know that this, look here, God is the same yesterday, today, and, and when they back there dedicated a particular thing to God, this presence of the God come on that thing and that thing now become a holy thing, you know? How is it that, the, yes, the, it's a building, but how is it that we want to come into that holy place that is dedicated to God? Dress a certain way. Um, and look here, I didn't even come to plan uh, to talk about these things. But look here, holiness, we can't I can't teach it. I can't teach you it. You have to know, be connected to the source and have that conviction that this is how I'm going to govern my life. I don't want you to think that I sit here and I'm above you. The same temptation that you have is the same. Probably I even have more than you. But the same spirit 
that raised Christ from the dead, if the same spirit will help you to make the same decision. And I am not going to tell you that I'm perfect. But you must maintain a relationship with the source. You are no more common a man. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a peculiar people. And you should show forth the praise. Your lifestyle should be saying, look here. God, I give you the glory. Peter, Peter said that you should walk holy in all manner of conversation. Anyway, you're living. Make sure it's a holy living. So to be holy, you must be connected to the source. And you must be separated unto God. That which is holy is separated unto God as his possession. When God brought his redeemed people to Mount Sinai, God said unto them, You shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. A holy nation. That is found in Exodus 19, 5 and 6. The relationship the nation of Israel had with God as a result of their deliverance from Egypt made them a holy nation. As an integral part of holiness, God claims ownership of what he sanctifies as his special treasure. So now that God saved us and delivered us from a spiritual Egypt, God claim ownership for us. Amen. And while he claim ownership for us, he sanctifies us as a special treasure. He sets us apart, which is holy for himself. When a person gets saved, he's connected to the source of holiness. God himself and God separate that person unto himself, thereby claiming him as his own property. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. God claim you. When God save you, God claim you as his own. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. This body that we're talking about, this that we dwell in. Because the spirit is the real man. This that we dwell in. Amen. Is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Which is in you. Which ye have of God and ye are not. You hear what the Bible say? You are not your own. God has the right to do what he wants in your you because you are his property. So it can't be about you anymore. It must be about what God wants. This means that he has the right to tell us how to live. He has the right to tell us what to wear. He has the right to tell us where to go. He has the right to tell us who to marry to. He has the right to tell us where to go to school. He has the right to tell us not to go to a dance or a party. God has the right because he has purchased you with a price. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. God has the right. God has purchased you. And he has the right to tell you what you should do and what you should not do. Amen. And when it comes to holiness, and that is why it's important, you have the Holy Spirit. It's important to be connected. To be holy, I must obey God's word. Leviticus 20, verses 7 to 8. It teaches us that there is an inseparable relationship between holiness and obedience in scripture. God said, sanctify yourselves therefore and be holy for I the Lord am holy. And you shall keep my what? Status and perform them. I am the Lord. There is an inseparable relationship between holiness and obedience to scripture. Again in Leviticus 23, 22 sorry, verses 31 
to 32, we read, You shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. Never shall you profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord which hallowed you. In the very same breath that God commanded us to be holy, he commanded us to obey his word. Therefore, holiness is displayed by being obedient. To God's word. A holy person is one who lives the scripture, is obedient to what the scripture says. You cannot knowingly be violating the word of God and say that you are holy. It is a contradiction. Peter's statement in Rome is similar to that of Paul and being not conformed to the world. And we said it earlier on, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Both Peter and Paul warn against worldliness. Worldliness may be defined as any attitude, action, or behavior that does not conform to God's word. And both apostles, they emphasized, they made emphasis on it. That look here, we're supposed to be separate and apart from the world. That which God chose, him chose. And him said, look here, if we choose you, you must be different. You must be separate, set apart. You must be peculiar. So why is it important for you to live holy? One, because it's a commandment of God. God commanded him, said, look here, be ye holy. And because I, the Lord, your God, is holy, and there is no question about that. Amen. There is not a greater being than God. And if God says holiness is what he requires, holiness is what God requires. And there is no two way about it. So why should you be holy? Because God requires it. First Peter again, be ye holy, for I am holy. It is a command. It is a requirement. If you don't obey the commandment, you transgress the law of God. You transgress what God requires. You will be going against his status. It is a command of God. Why should we be holy? Look here. If you don't live holy, you can't go to heaven. David said, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He said, he that had a clean hands and a pure heart, who had not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sown defeat, deceit fully. David asks a basic question about approaching God, and he ponders who can climb the hill of the Lord to worship in the tabernacle, and who can enter the Lord's presence. But he also gave the answer. He said, he that had a clean hand, hands and pure heart, who had not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. In a similar way, we will not get to that place if we don't live a holy life. We cannot get to his holy hill. That place that he dwells, we will not be there at the marriage supper. Amen. If we don't live holy, we're not going there. And then Hebrews 4, Hebrews 12, sorry, 14. It says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And this is a fitting scripture to end with. Follow peace with all men. 
there will be time when, when it, it, just, it, it just can't be peaceful. But you have to try to follow peace. You have to try to make peace be there. Because anytime you start operating out of anger, you go away, swear, and you can't believe say after, after, after 10 years of serving God, you can still swear. But you're going to find yourself swearing. And without holiness. Say so follow peace and holiness. And without that, you can't see God. I don't want it, it don't it, it don't make sense. We start serving God so long and now at this stage. We're doing some things that, that God not pleased with. And, and, and this is what the, the apostle, the, when, when you look at the different churches, they, they have to talk about brotherly love. They have to talk about this. They have to talk about holiness. And, and this just, this just form a part of the doctrine. So we said that the, the, the things that they spoke about was belief, mostly. They talk about repentance, water baptism, in filling of the Holy Ghost and living a holy life. That was the five basic things that the apostles talk about. They talk about that mostly. Right? They talk about other things because they talk about the one God. Amen. And they talk about brotherly love. And they talk about but everything come together about the five basic things that they spoke about was repentance, belief, repentance, water baptism, in filling of the Holy Spirit and holiness. Amen. Next week when we come back, God's willing, we will now get into the different doctrines. Amen. And we will look at what these doctrines says. We have been, been, been saying and looking at what some of the doctrines around us. Some, and remember now, doctrine is basically teaching. We have been looking at what some of these doctrines, some of these teachings have been saying to us. Amen. And, and when we come next week, we want to know, get into the doctrines and look at the doctrine. Look at what they are saying. And, 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 and it's able now to say, from what we went through, through the apostles' doctrine, that look here. We identify it. We know it. We know the plan of the, the adversary. And we're not bowing. We're not moving. We're going to stand up for that which God has called us to. God bless you tonight in the name of the Lord. Just bow your heads while I pray. Lord, we come to you one more time and we thank you, God, for that which was mentioned. We thank you, God, for all those who tuned in. And we pray, God, that you will continue to bless your people, continue to instruct them, continue to guide them. Mighty God, we are living in the last are closing days. Some serious time gone and some serious things are happening. God, there are some doctrines out there, mighty God, that is just unbelievable. But we know, mighty God, that the devil is trying everything to deceive men. Amen. Trying to deceive even those who you have called to serve you. But we pray, God, that you will build a edge around us, build a edge around our minds. And help us to stand for that which you have called us to. We pray, God, that you will continue to bless us as we go through this. We continue to keep us. Continue to rest your unchanging hands upon us. Lord, we look to you one more time and we bless your name. God, we give a thanks right now for hearing and for answering. In the name of the Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Amen. Amen. And the Lord richly bless you, God's willing. We'll be here next week, same time, same place, and we will look into what some of the other doctrines say. Amen. God bless you in Jesus' name.